Good morning, church. As you continue to make your way in and find your place, we welcome you to St. Andrew Baptist Church this morning. We have one goal, one goal this morning, and that is to exalt Christ. In everything we do, as we sing, we exalt Christ. As we give, we exalt Christ. As we hear the truth of his word and apply that to our lives, we exalt Christ. If you're new with us, we welcome you. Welcome to St. Andrew Baptist Church. Uh, if you want to figure out how you can connect better here, you can do that by going to the Next Steps desk after the service. So when the service is over, you have questions about St. Andrew, questions about faith, uh, questions about how you can connect, we can help you at the Next Steps desk when the service is over. Pray with me as we begin our worship this morning. Father, we come to exalt you in every way and in everything we do. Lord, you are worthy of our worship. No one else. Just one name, the name of Jesus. That's the name that we proclaim today. Father, you're worthy. We love you. Help us worship you in spirit and in truth. Even now, we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Those of you watching online, please don't be a spectator, be a participator. Sing with us. Let's praise the Lord together today here in this place. I lift his name high.
Praise the Lord. Amen. God's word makes it very clear. If you have Christ in your heart, you're a child of God. Amen. Not because others say so, but because that's who God says you are. This song then just says, come, let us exalt the Lord together. As children of God, receivers of his grace, his mercy, his protection. Let's praise him today, being our only holy God. Who else commands all the host of heaven? Who else can make every king bow down? Who else could whisper in darkness trembles? Only a holy God. What other beauty demands such praises? What other splendor? Yeah. 
Thank you. You may be seated. Well, the end of this week, beginning of next week, is going to be a very important time as school gets started back. How many of you have someone who is dear to you, whether here or somewhere else around the world, but someone who's dear to you that'll be starting back in school. Yeah, most of us do. So because of that, we're going to spend some time in prayer uh, for all of those that are going back to, to school. Without question, there's a mixture of excitement and fear, confusion, a lot of different feelings that people are having right now as they anticipate going back will continue to, to have. But folks, let us remember, feelings are not what's most important. What's most important is putting our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting in our great God who loves us and cares for us and has purpose for all of those who are going back in whatever capacity back to school. So we're going to pray this morning. Now, first of all, if there's any, any children in here, I want children to stand. But also, if you have a child or a grandchild that's going back to school, I want you to stand also. So children, those that have children or grandchildren going back to school, and my wife, Miss Karen, our children's minister, is going to come and pray for all of our children and their parents and grandparents. Father, we come before you as we have sung, God, you are a holy God. You are the one who can take care of anything we face in our lives. And God, every year at going back to school time, parents pray for their children and children have some fears about that first day of school and new beginnings. But God, we know this year is a little different. And Lord, we just again cry out to you. But Lord, we can do it in faith knowing that this is not a problem too great for you that you are able to handle everything that our kids will encounter in school. And Lord, I just pray for 
all the children as they go back to school, that Lord, when they step into that school or on that campus, Father, they'll remember, God loves me. God's with me. And I do not have to be afraid. That like the psalmist, they would say, what time I feel afraid or am afraid, I will trust in God. And God, their hope is in you, and we praise you for that. Lord, you know every child that's represented here by grandparents and parents. And Lord, you know what they're experiencing right now if they are having fears and concerns about their new year. And Lord, those that are being taught at home, Lord, they have a new beginning too, and it's a different time for them as well. So Father, for every child, whatever they're experiencing, would you just wrap your arms around them and just whisper to them, I've got you. I love you. I created you. You're mine. And this is going to be okay. God, we thank you for that. And Lord, I lift up parents and grandparents because they even have a bigger, broader understanding of the world that we're facing right now. And Lord, naturally, they have such concerns for their children. But God, our hope is in you. And Lord, really, you are giving us a great opportunity here to be the strongest voice in their little lives. God, when they see people all around them doing uncertain and not good things, Lord, that they can look to their family and see that mom and dad and grandparents trust in the Lord. They trust in you to guide their family. And God, that gives such security to our children. And Father, just remind us as parents and grandparents, there is nothing that is too great for you. And Lord, we do have to step back and let them go on their own, but they are not without you. And Lord, our greatest impact on them is lifting them up to you, crying out to God on their behalf daily. And Lord, thank you that we can speak truth into them every night when they come home, every Sunday as we bring them to worship. We speak truth into them. That gives them that foundation, God, that they need as they go to school. Lord, bless parents as they tell this generation to come the praises of our God and the great things he has done. Because God, as they proclaim that to their children, their children will hope in the Lord. And God, I am confident that you have great plans in store, that you want to show yourself strong and have glory come to you as we rest and we trust in you for this school year. We love you so much in Jesus' name. Now, some of you are going to want to stay standing. I'm going to ask the students from seventh grade up through college, their parents and their grandparents now to stand. So if you have students of that age, I want to ask you to stand. And Brother Mark, our student minister, is going to lead us in prayer for them. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for an opportunity to go back to school. I can't believe that we're praying that, but we're praying that this morning. And we're grateful to be back. We're grateful to have this opportunity to, to start moving back to, um, Lord, a, a new sense of, of normal, whatever that means for us, God. But we know, just as, as, as Karen has prayed, that in the midst of, of this, there's still fear and anxiety, frustration. Uh, Lord, all, all things that we feel going into this. Um, some of us just... Um, are, are done with it. Uh, some of us are still captivated by it. But God, wherever we find ourselves in, in this, may we find ourselves in your grace and in your grip, God, this morning. And I pray for the students this morning. I know that um, a lot of them just, they, they feel invincible. They feel that uh, this, is, this, this virus has been going around. It's not going to affect them as much. And uh, I know with that just comes, um, Lord, sometimes they're not acting in a, in a safe manner sometimes. But God, I just pray that uh, our students would just be mindful of their surroundings uh, they would be mindful of the guidelines. I pray that uh, they would be able to use this as a testimony that they say that they love their fellow neighbor, that they, they love the people around them, and that they would be able to just uh, act in a way to not endanger anybody else. 
Uh, but God, that they would just live, uh, Lord, just in, in confidence, uh, Lord, and as a conquering hero that's come into our lives, God, that you have caused us to not live in fear. Uh, so I just pray that, uh, Lord, the way our students conduct themselves on the campus, uh, Lord, is a, is a testament for, for your glory. I pray for uh, the parents and grandparents of, of these students and college students, God. Uh, Lord, I just know that the frustration that they feel with these guidelines that are just coming down from administration. And uh, Lord, I know that it would be easy for us to uh, get frustrated with teachers and, and, and faculty. Uh, Lord, I just pray that when those feelings come, that you would dismiss those in our lives, that we would be able to uh, approach everything when it comes to these school regulations with love and grace. God, that may it be said of, of Christians uh, in, in our community that, uh, Lord, that when, when negative things happen, we responded with love and grace. Let that be our testimony, uh, Lord, as we head back to school more than anything. But God, we, we do pray for protection, but God, we're not paralyzed by that prayer. We, we know that you have not given us a, a sense of fear, uh, Lord, but we know that perfect love cast out fear. So help us to move forward in that. Help us to move forward, uh, Lord, not to be paralyzed uh, by fear, but be overcomers by your love. Lord, we love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Finally, I'm going to lead a prayer for the teachers. So if you are a teacher or a worker in school, public school, private school, home school, or you have a, a child uh, who is uh, a teacher or a grandchild who's going to be working in school, you stand right now. I'm going to pray for the teachers. Father, we do especially pray for teachers because, uh, Lord, while... Our children and our, our young people may not be very much afraid. A lot of our teachers are afraid. Uh, not just afraid for themselves, but just afraid for what's going to happen because of all the uncertainty. Lord, I pray that all of those who are believers, that you will remind them that you are the light the light of the world, the light that shines upon our path and directs our way when we are walking in uncertainty. I pray, Lord, that you would cause them to put all their confidence and trust in you. Day by day, encourage them, strengthen them, make them aware of your presence with them to walk them through what you have for them in this most unusual and in many ways difficult time. And we pray it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let me ask you please to remember uh, to continue to pray. Pray for students of all ages. Pray for the teachers. Pray for the schools. Uh, they've never faced something like this. And uh, they need your prayers daily. So let's not forget them, even if we don't have somebody immediately in our family to remind us uh, to pray. Try to, try to make a point to remember them as they go back to school. Now, the title of my message today, as we continue to rejoice in the faithfulness of God, is God is faithful in helping you teach. Now, a lot of you are saying right now, but I'm not a teacher. But that's what Philip said. <laughs> that's what Philip said. But I want you to look and listen with me at how much God helped Philip to teach. Now, I've organized the message this morning a little differently. Normally, I take a, a main text. We usually read it somewhere near the beginning. And then I will give you two or three or a dozen points about that, that text. Not today. Today, I want to walk you through the biblical story of Philip. And particularly the part where God showed his faithfulness to Philip to help him teach in a most fascinating situation. Because what God did with Philip to help him teach is something that God is willing to do in each of us. 
God is willing to make each of us the teacher God wants us to be. He's willing to help us teach the most important truth that there is to teach. And he will help us teach this truth in a way that it will make a greater difference in people's lives than anything else they ever learn. So we're going to be looking in Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 26. As it says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. Folks, I'll tell you, even if you're not going back to school, Wherever you are going, wherever you go, the Lord can direct your path and send you to the person he wants to direct you to speak to, who he wants to direct you, as in Philip's case, to teach, to share something that they do not know, to explain something that they do not know understand. But now let me remind you, because I I find it interesting after God tells him, you go down on the road to Gaza, the angel says, this is desert. (laughs) This is wilderness. This is not a pleasant place. Because sometimes when the Lord directs our path to go and speak to someone, to minister in someone's life, It's not always a fun or a pleasant place. Now, when I started thinking about God sending Philip to the wilderness, I had to think about some of the places God has sent me in Brazil. You know, in in Brazil, you know, Brazil has a lot of beautiful tourist places. I have spent about one half of 1% of my time in Brazil at those tourist places. I mean, I have seen a couple of them and they are beautiful and I'm glad that in those occasions God opened a window where we got to, got to see some of those things. But that's not generally what we see. And in most of the trips we go on, we don't get anywhere near a spot that you would call a tourist location. And in my training trips, I never get near uh, those spots. In fact, I intentionally do my pastor leader training in remote areas because I'm trying to minister to pastors and to, to young people in ministry that don't have good access to theological and biblical training. And, and they're not in the great big cities. They're out in the sparse areas, and so that's where I go. And I I think about one particular place where we not only did some church planting work in this region, but I went back and did three years of pastor training in Alexandria. Now, Alexandria in Rio Grande de Norte, I love the place. I love it, but I love it because of the people who are there. I'll tell you what, it's a desert literally. It's out in the middle of an arid region. They, while I was there, they were in the midst of a five-year drought. They were bringing in trucks with water, and they had a big hose, and, and every three days they would run this hose into the houses to fill up their water tank to last them another three, four, five days. It was arid. I remember the first night that uh, a guy that, that drove me, met me at the airport and drove me there. I was so glad. I don't really like to drive in, in Brazil. And uh, so he met me at the airport and, and he drove me. It was about a five-hour drive and it took a lot longer than we expected. So we got there after dark. We didn't plan it that way. It's just the way that it happened. We got there and we first tried to find a place to to eat and all we found was kind of a little uh, convenience store with a deli counter. So we we bought something. We went out on the sidewalk. There was a little table and we ate there. And then we went to the place where the pastor who had organized this had said, "Uh, I've I've rented a room for you. And uh, 
Now, the first thing we found out is there are no hotels, no hotels in Alexandria. And this was a lady who rented two rooms. And we went upstairs to one of these rooms, and there was a one bulb in the ceiling. It must have been about 15 watts. And there was one cot there, and there was a little indention that had a pipe coming out, and that was the shower. And I won't even describe the rest of the facilities, but they were commensurate with, with that. Well, stayed there for three days for the, uh, for the, the training. You didn't go there for the accommodations, is what I'm trying to say. And folks, I, I say that, to, but, but then, then let, let, me, let me add this. But then I got to the little church that was hosting this, really a regional training. And I had the most wonderful group of young adults that ranged from 17 to about 27 every one of them either in ministry or well on their way to spending their entire lives as missionaries or pastors or church planters. And that's what drew me back. Man, it wasn't because I wanted to go back. By the way, I did find a better room than that. Uh, it wasn't a lot better, but it was better <laughs> and, uh, uh, the, the next time. So the, the, Lord, the Lord blessed me, and it made me really grateful. If I'd seen that first room, the first trip, I probably would have described it to you and thought, well, that was, that was bad. But it was so much better than, than the other one. I was thanking the Lord for it. But, but it was the opportunity that God had given me there to teach and to, to have a part in those people's lives that was so important. And I wouldn't trade that for anything. Folks, the Lord will send you. If you are willing to go, if you are willing to be his instrument to speak, God will direct you to people. God will direct you to places to go where you'll encounter the people he wants you to talk to. I do not guarantee it will be where you want to go. I don't promise it's going to be fun. I don't, I don't promise that about the place that you, you go or everything that happens, you're going to say that was wonderful. But when you connect with the person that God connects you with, it is going to be a glorious, glorious experience that you'll remember and you'll delight in the rest of your life. In verse 27 and 28. So he arose and went. Folks, I could stop right there. I could stop right there. When the Lord sends you, if you will just arise and go, if you'll just say yes, when God prompts you and when God leads you, that's the beginning point to receiving all that God has for you and being a, a part of the lives of the people to whom God sends you. But you've got to arise and go. You can't just sit and stay. Philip knew the Lord had sent him. He arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all of her treasury. Wow. Folks, when you go where God tells you to go, you talk to the people the Lord gives you the opportunity to talk to, you will talk to people that in this world are the great and the small. Of course, every one of them is important in the eyes of God. But, but you'll find yourself talking to people of every station, of every place in life. And Philip had no idea when God was sending him to the desert that there he would meet the second most powerful person in the kingdom of Ethiopia, which was at that time a powerful kingdom. But that's who God had to talk, had him prepared to talk to. 
And God was already working in his life. Because he had made the trip from Ethiopia to Jerusalem and was now coming back from Jerusalem, headed back to Ethiopia, but he had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was a God seeker. He knew the one true and living God had his temple in Jerusalem. And so he went to Jerusalem to worship. And it says he was returning and sitting in his chariot, he was reading from Isaiah the prophet. Now, folks, this tells us how very much God was already working in the life of this man who was a God seeker. Now, understand, he did not yet know God personally. He was not saved. If he had died before Philip taught him and showed him and explained the way of life to him, he would have gone straight to hell. He was seeking God, but he had not yet found him. Folks, there, will, there are people all around you wherever you go who are God seekers. They're looking for God. They may be looking in the wrong places. They may be looking in the wrong way. They may be walking the wrong, wrong direction in their life that's not drawing them closer and closer at all, but sending them further and further away. And there may be things about their life that because of that, you just despise the way they're living, the way they're talking, and the way they're doing. But in their heart, they really want to know Who is God? What is God like? How could I know God? They're seeking God. God promises that if a man or a woman will seek seek him with all of their heart, they will find him. So when there is a God seeker like this Ethiopian eunuch who is actually seeking God, God will work in his life to do what is necessary for him to hear the gospel and come to Christ. That's why God sent Philip. And already God had put into the hands of this man the scroll of Isaiah. Now, do you realize how unusual that is? Remember that scrolls of portions of the Old Testament scripture at this time And we're talking about in first century A.D. We're talking about shortly after the resurrection of Christ. But in this day, every scroll was written by hand. Do you know Isaiah in my Bible, which is not a large print Bible. I probably am going to need to change that. But this one is not a large print Bible. So if I'm like this, you'll understand. But Isaiah 68 pages. Can you imagine? This was a sizable scroll. But can you imagine how long it took a scribe to copy the book of Isaiah? Can you imagine what it cost? Listen, friend, you couldn't even go to the bookstore. I mean the scroll store. You you couldn't go to the scroll store and buy one. You know, that they were treasured. They were only kept in regular places. And for God, what God did to put the scroll of Isaiah into the hands of this Ethiopian eunuch, I cannot even imagine, much less describe to you. But can you see that it was most unusual? God did something great to get Isaiah into this man's hands. Folks, if the Lord leads you to someone, if, if you, you sense God's encouragement to talk with someone, you can be sure that God is preparing them. God is working on them. God's working from the inside. He just wants you to cooperate with, with him. I know many people have a fear of witnessing cold turkey. Friend, let me tell you. If you're talking to somebody that the Lord has led you to talk to, you're never talking cold turkey. You're just stepping in on a conversation God has already begun in their hearts. And you get to join in 
on that. God was preparing this man. Now verses 29 to 31. <clears throat> then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake his chariot. So Philip ran to him. Is that what you do when the Lord prompts you? <laughs> do you run to the opportunity? Do you? I guess, I guess I'll go tomorrow. Philip ran to the opportunity. The Lord spoke to him and he, and he ran and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. And he said, do you understand what you're reading? Note the use of questions here. Note that Philip also was listening. He heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. So when we're going to talk with people where the Lord prompts us, we need to listen to what they're saying. We need to hear where they are. We need to hear what's happening that they will share. And then it's always good to put questions in the conversation. Questions that let us understand what they are thinking, where they are. The eunuch said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, folks, let me tell you, once Philip ran up to the chariot and the first thing he did was ask a, a question. He heard him reading and he said, do you understand? It just flowed from there. When God leads us to talk to people, he's not leading us to force ourselves on them. He's not leading us to just, just go in and pound away and hammer. He, he wants us just to talk. Go as far with the person as they want you to go. Don't go any further. If the Spirit of God is not moving them to listen, to go further in the conversation, then it's a conversation for another day or for another person. Just go as far as they'll let you go. You don't ever, when, when they become resistant and they don't want to talk, don't feel like you just have to keep on going. That's what scares people sometimes about, about sharing is they feel like, well, I've got to get to the end of, of my presentation. No, you don't. Just go as far as they want you to go. Share as much as they want you to share. And, and if it's all of it on a particular day, glory to God. But if it's not, that's in God's hands. We have to realize we are speaking for the Lord. And so the Lord is working from the inside. And if he does not move them to want to hear more, then don't share more. And don't worry about it. That's God's business. It says, and the place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation for his life was taken from the earth? Let me pause. Do you see what God is doing? <laughs> Do you see how much God is working? He's not only reading the scroll of Isaiah, he is reading what we call chapter 53. Now, the scroll he has does not have chapters. But he's reading about the suffering servant. He's reading that portion of scripture that today Bible students call the gospel according to Isaiah. He is reading about the Messiah, the suffering servant of God that God will send to save us all from our sins. This is so much the gospel 
describing what Jesus would do for our, uh, on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. This is so much the gospel that in, in times where Bible critics reigned, like from the early 1800s, late 1700s, through the mid-1900s, that very broad period of time when across the enlightened world, Bible critics reigned and they made all these statements that made it sound like anybody that believes the Bible is just a fool, just an unlearned fool. And one of the favorite things that they like to say was, you know, in the book of Isaiah, the New Testament church rewrote portions of Isaiah and especially Isaiah chapter 53 to read into what Isaiah wrote that it was about Christ, that it was about the Messiah and they changed the scroll of Isaiah. And they were bold enough to make that charge because there were no ancient scrolls. There were no scrolls during all that time that had been discovered that predated the, the days of the church. All the scrolls, in fact, were centuries and centuries beyond the formation of the, of the church, most of them around the 10th century A.D., and so, so they thought, well, there's no evidence. And so if this, this clearly is the message of the gospel in Isaiah, so surely some Christian or some group of Christians wrote this into the book of Isaiah. And so they continued to charge until you remember, well, some of you will remember. I don't even remember when this happened. I remember reading about it as a little boy. But in the late 1940s, a shepherd threw a rock into a cave looking for a goat that had run away. And he went, click. And he went inside. He found these jars that had been sealed up. And that led eventually to the discovery of hundreds of jars. And in those jars were what we now know as the Dead Sea Scrolls. And among these scrolls were many portions of the Old Testament. Now, there were a lot of other things too, but many portions of the Old Testament. But among the, in one of the jars was a whole scroll of Isaiah. I wonder if it was the one the eunuch was carrying. <laughs> Don't know. But it was from about that time. It was a scroll that had been put away actually probably 50 to 100 years before Christ came. It was a scroll that nobody questioned was written hundreds of years before Christ came to the earth. And so, you know, Unrolling these scrolls is quite a difficult process. It takes a lot of scientific uh, finesse to even get the scrolls unrolled without them just turning into tiny little bits. But eventually over time, they were able to unroll the scroll where it could be read. And they went to chapter 53. And they compared it to the more modern versions from the 10th century A.D. And they found it read exactly the same. Word for word for word. And so they found with the entirety of the scroll of Isaiah. It had not been changed a lick. It was God who put the gospel in Isaiah chapter 53. And it was God who led the Ethiopian eunuch to read that. And the next verse says, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth. He hadn't said a whole lot till now. He opened his mouth and beginning at the scripture, preached Jesus to him. 
he began to teach. And we're at the midpoint of my sermon. <laughs> so next week, I'm going to finish this sermon with you. But you know, I've given us more than enough for us to know what to do this week. The Lord said to Philip, go. He showed him someone he had to talk to. Philip only went as far as God let him go with the permission of the man that he talked to. And he started asking questions. When the man was ready, he preached Jesus. Now I can tell you, if I'll do that much this week, I'll have a good week on God's list. <laughs> if you'll do this much, whether you go to school or you go to work or you go see a neighbor or you go see a relative, if you'll just say to the Lord, Lord, I'm willing. I'm willing to teach who you want me to teach. You've taught me the gospel. <laughs> I know the gospel. I'm willing to share. I won't push, don't want to push. But Lord, I'll share as long as you have them open. Stand with me and pray that prayer with me. Lord, I'll go at your urging. Lord, I'll listen to who you want me to listen to. Even if the place is not pleasant, if the smell is not pleasant, if the setting is not delightful, Lord, as you direct me, I'll go. As you point me, I'll speak. Lord, I'll go as far as they'll let me go because I know you are the motivator of the heart. And if they want me to go further, it's because you're moving in their life. Ultimately, I'll share Jesus. Ultimately, I'll share the gospel. If you just give me the opportunity, Lord. Philip ran. Lord, I don't run real well right now. But I'll go directly. I'll go directly. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still when striving cease
You may be seated. Let me say if there is someone here today that, that God touched your heart in just hearing just the beginnings of the gospel message, but you want to know God personally, you don't know how, but you say, man, I don't want to wait for someone to come to me. I want to know now. You go over to the next steps desk right there. Brother Heath will be glad to share with you right now how you can know God personally. If you need help in some other way, that's what our Next Steps desk is for, and I encourage you to, to go. Now, listen to this important, really important announcement. Today, I have called two special church conferences. We've not had a church conference now in a long time because of this pandemic. But I've called two special church conferences, each one to be held at the close of worship next Sunday. The close of each of our worship services, August the 23rd. The purpose of each of these church conferences is for the church to consider adding as new members to St. Andrew Baptist Church five people. Laura Martin, Stephen Joy Lamas, Clinton and Stacy Pebbler. Uh, we have pictures of everyone. No? No pictures? Okay. Sorry, thought we had pictures. <laughs> anyway, uh, these are the ones that we will be um, voting on. We will have pictures of them next week. Now, members of our church, you are welcome to attend either one or both of these church conferences, but the agenda will be the same at each. All we're doing is we will be voting on these as new members of our church. Yes, even during the pandemic, God has given us people who desire to be members, and we've decided it's best not to wait uh, any longer. Plus, this will be the first church conferences that we have before we are all fully assembled, but not the last. More are coming quickly for some exciting purposes. So we're gonna have our first one to admit these new members to our fellowship, okay? As you leave, uh, voter guides, if you want it for the primary election that's being held this next week, they will be at the next steps desk, they will be at the welcome desk in the foyer. So if you've gotten your sample ballot and you've looked at it and say, man, I don't know, uh, Pete from Sam, uh, well, you, this will help. It's a, it's a Christian uh, voter's guide that will tell you a little bit. So you're welcome to pick one of those up if you would like. Let me remind you that we worship the Lord also through our giving. If you're online, you can give at our website. You can give uh, by texting. That information is on your screen at home as well as on ours. Uh, for those of you that are here, there are giving stations as you go out the doors that you may, may use. I will tell you what, setting up regular online giving, which I did about 20 years ago, uh, six years before I came to this church when online giving was brand new. I mean, you had to work to do that. But I set it up. Been one of the greatest things I've ever done. Uh, you know, I never have to worry about getting in uh, my, my tithe and offering to the Lord. And so I just commend it to you. It's a wonderful thing for me personally. I love using it. Let's stand together. Lord, we bless your holy name. You are a wonderful, wonderful God. Filled with power so much that there is nothing you cannot do. Filled with love and kindness and goodness so that we know that your desires toward us are always benevolent. You want the very best in our lives. Oh Lord, we honor we worship we praise your name we give you thanksgiving for this time lord that we could worship you for this time that we could just see a small portion of what your word teaches us and shows us to do we thank you 
Now bless us as we go out. Help a spirit of God who lives within us to go out doing what you've shown us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.